Hello and welcome to Magic is Real. I'm Shannon. I'm your host. And today I have with me Betty Guadagno. And uh, <laughs> thank you. And I'm so happy to have her here. Um, she is a near death experiencer, but also a recovering addict, as am I. And therefore, I'm really looking forward to diving in and hearing her insights and her story. Thank you so much for being here, Betty. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for this space that you've created for people to just yeah have space to share about their spiritual experiences. And yeah, hopefully today we'll share a lot about our recovery journeys. Yes, thank you. It, it means a lot to have have you here. So if you can just start by giving us um, just a story about you and who you are, where you come from, what your background is, and also what your spiritual beliefs may have been. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So I had a near-death like experience. Uh, I have some language for it today. I had a Kundalini awakening. And if you don't know what Kundalini energy is, that's okay. Neither did I. <laughs> uh, Kundalini is described as life force energy. So in different cultures, we call it different things. So I had this life force energy activation awakening in March of 2019 that completely transformed my life. I went from an atheist, a drug addict, a prostitute, homeless, to having my whole life transform in a completely opposite direction. And uh, it was really thanks to this spiritual experience kind of waking me up and pushing me forcefully onto another path. Uh, I grew up in like a really chaotic, dysfunctional family. Um, you know, my, my whole family is just like this perpetual cycle of sexual trauma, emotional trauma, physical trauma. And, um, and yeah, I experienced a, a really traumatic loss at a very young age when I was 23. My parents, who were both active addicts, made a decision to intentionally overdose together. They committed suicide when I was 23. My sister was 18. Uh, we found them. And, you know, like this trauma was, it just engulfed me. It became... Well, number one, it became a huge part of my identity because I was able to victimize myself in this very loud way. So because I was so in my victim mentality, I used it as an excuse to do whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, to whomever I wanted. And my life became just so immersed in my own spiritual shadow. I was very manipulative, ruthless, aggressive. I, I became a perpetrator, you know, like I felt like a victim my whole life. And I, you know, I said, no more, like now I'm going to be the abuser. And so I really switched that role for myself and, um, and my addiction really helped me do that. And my addiction kind of became my parents uh, when my parents died, you know, like it just became my whole identity. And it was all that I knew, like I'm covered in tattoos of like liquor bottles and packs of cigarettes because like this was going to be my life. I was perfectly content living and dying to use. It, it came before every relationship, every job, every home, every pet, you know, like nothing was more important than staying sedated and medicated throughout my experience. And after I had this, this awakening, um, yeah, it just became very clear to me that I could no longer continue living the life that I was living. That's perfect. You summed that up so beautifully and so eloquently. Um, and it, and it speaks for itself. People become addicts to escape pain. We all do. That's anything we're addicted to. People are addicted to their phones. They're addicted to gambling. They're addicted to shopping. It's all just to escape how we're feeling. And um, actually, as I've talked about a lot on this podcast, I'm a recovering sex and love addict. And to me, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it too. What I, what felt right to me is that all addictions stem from love addiction. It's the lack of self-love. It's that whole, they call it a God-sized hole. You don't have to take that literally if you're not comfortable with that term, but it doesn't mean you're not religious. So you're empty. It means you're out of touch with your own self, your own soul, your own connection with source, God. Um, and so I've always kind of seen, I've seen a lot of addicts come into Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous and say, uh, I, I actually heard a heroin addict say, I kicked heroin, this is more painful. Mm -hmm. And I ended up here. And so many people ended up coming from AA, NA, all the other uh, programs and ended up realizing this is the thing. Um, so I love, I mean, if you have thoughts about that, I'd love to hear. Oh my God. So many yeah. thoughts. I'm like covered in goosebumps. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I, 
I also am, yeah, I'm like dual, I'm every kind of addicted, right? I just don't want to feel my feelings because like, I don't think that I can handle them. Or like my ego doesn't think that it can handle them. And so it doesn't matter what it is. It could be men, food, sex, drugs, alcohol, binge watching TV. It could be anything. Just so long as I don't have to feel my feelings because they feel too big for me. So um, I am a person who, yeah, ha- like has some issues with limerence. I get like very addicted to people, yeah. uh, people that like don't even know that I exist. I'm like, hello, Ryan Gosling, we're meant to be sending you a million emails. Not literally. Well, I, I mean, know. maybe not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, like I, and, and the 12 steps have really worked as a tool for me in all areas of my life. I also have, have experienced a lot of challenges with eating disorders. Um, so like when I let go of drugs, you know, the eating disorders were always there. And so was this person obsession and this codependency. It was always there, but I was too sedated to realize it. And, you know, when it comes to relationships with other people, I watched my parents model a very toxically codependent relationship with each other to me throughout my life. Um, you know, like to the point of, you know, their death together that like they, they couldn't live together and they, you know, like it was just so toxically codependent. Like there was no boundary to where one began and the other one ended. Like they were just blurred into like this one very sort of sick individual, you know, like uh, very tortured. And yeah, so for me, I've used the 12 steps as a tool to release my obsession around all of these different aspects of myself, around my codependency, around my drug addiction, around my eating disorders, um, around my limerence. Like I've had to actually surrender my will to a power greater than myself. And, you know, 12 step fellowship is really, it's a spiritual program. It's not religious, it's highly spiritual. And you get to design your concept of a higher power. Now, like I had a spiritual experience where I felt like I was talking to God, <laughs> you know, like it was very clear that like there was something bigger than me. And I was mad because I was an atheist going into it, you know, and so my little pieces of my personality were still there. And like, as I was traveling into the space of eternity, I was like, what? I'm wrong. This is crazy. There's no way that I'm wrong, you know? And um, so in my 12 step fellowship, I've got, I've gotten to be able to design my conception of a higher power. Now it's not the same conception that I had, even in that spiritual experience, like I am growing and evolving and integrating. And so my conception of a higher power also grows and evolves and integrates within me. So yeah, the, the thing that I thought you know, four years ago is not the thing that I think today. And that's practicing that spiritual principle of open-mindedness. I am open to the fact that the idea can change. It can grow. It can get smaller, you know, like it can fit me in, in the space where I am. You just have such a way with words. <laughs> You're so articulate, eloquent. Are, are you writing? Because I you're am a writing, beautiful, yes. right? Yeah, I you just put words together so well. Um, well, yeah, let's talk about the Kundalini experience. I misspoke when I said near death experience, but near death like experience. Tell it's us okay, how that yeah. happened. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, you know, it it is like it maybe it was a near death experience. I don't know. I was never actually pronounced dead. So I feel like that's kind of the line yeah. between the experiences. Uh, but it, I definitely went to the same space that near death experiencers describe. And um, yeah, so basically what happened in my experience was I ended up overdosing. You know, like I just need more, 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 like more of everything. And I did too much. And I ended up having this, um, yeah, really spiritually transformative experience. And, you know, there was voices that led me into my experience. One of them was of my father. And I had had a boyfriend who had recently passed away before my experience. His voice was there as well. And they, they were kind of guiding me into the space of eternity. But before I kind of got onto that, it kind of felt like a stream, like getting beamed up a little bit. Um, I went through, well, yeah, the best way that I can describe it is like a, a, like a life review. I started to feel the emotions of all of these plot points in my life. And I wasn't only feeling them from my own perspective. I was feeling them from the other person's perspective. And the, the memory that sticks out very vividly for me is the memory of my parents committing suicide. I didn't only feel it as a grieving daughter in that moment of my spiritual experience. I also felt it as them. And like the pain and desperation and like, 
I mean, it was so all encompassing. It, it felt like what I imagine, you know, people describe hell to be like, you know, like it was an actual real experience. And um, I just kept hearing my dad's voice, like as I was going through these feelings and he was saying, you are worthy of all the love in the universe. You are worthy of all the love in the universe. And I just kind of followed that voice, even though I didn't believe that for one second. And I, you know, started to go into the light. And when I landed, it felt like I landed kind of like on the deck of a spaceship. Um, I don't know if you remember the Gravitron rides from carnivals, but it was just like that. Like, yeah. you know, it, it, was like it looks like a spaceship that spins really fast. You throw yes. yourself up against the wall. That was it. And I came out of like the side of one of the walls. And I was on this deck and there was households and there was like this person in the center. And it felt, I mean, yeah, the download was that I was part of a spiritual army, but we were all spiritual warriors and we were gearing up for our mission to earth. And like, everybody was all hyped up and screaming and like, yeah, we're good, you know, and sort of like this Christ light or Krishna light, like higher consciousness was the commander, uh, like getting us all ready, like for this jump to earth and everybody's really excited. And I'm seeing all of us in my mind's eye, and like everything is kind of happening simultaneously. And I'm presented with a table of beings and they're like thumbing through this big, gigantic book. And they're like, oh, uh, you know, nice to see you. You're not actually supposed to be here yet, you know? So I'm seeing the mission and then I'm seeing this table and it, I, they didn't tell me who they were, but it definitely felt like people that were in charge of something. And they're like, okay, thumbing through the book, like, okay, yeah, yeah, you're not, it's not your time. You gotta go back. And I'm like looking around me and I'm like, me? <laughs> not me, like, I'm not going back. <laughs> you know, I'm like, I didn't know where I was or what was happening, but. I knew that I finally felt whole and complete and my whole life I had felt so fractured into so many different pieces and this was like the glue that brought me all together and there was no way that I was coming back to earth and then they told me that I had actually planned my life for this mission that I had just saw that I had chosen every aspect of my life every ounce of pain every ounce of love every aspect I had mapped it out before I took this mission to go down to earth. And, you know, I was like very dismissive. I was like, no way, not the stuff that I've been through. Like, there's no way somebody would pick that. And then they, they showed me, they took me through the details of the pre-birth plan. It was very animated. I was in a grocery store. I was like grabbing life experience cereal boxes off of the grocery shelves and like throwing it into this big empty cart. And I was throwing everything in there. Like, addiction, prostitution, homelessness, my parents, picking my parents, picking the family line that I would be born into. Um, the, the probability of my parents ending their lives together was like super, super high. Uh, and that's like kind of how all that played out in my mind's eye. I saw the moment that I picked the person that would molest me when I was a small child, the moment that we came into contract with one another and the reasons why. And one of the main reasons was in a previous life, I had, I had been his sexual abuser. And so in this lifetime, we were balancing it out for each other. And I'm downloaded with all this information. There's also stuff in the Part that like I had not experienced yet in my life, like spiritual awakening, overcoming, recovery, being a writer, being an author, being a speaker, like none of those things had happened in my life yet. So I just thought, oh, wow, that's really lovely cart filler. <laughs> like not, nothing resonated, you know? And, um, you know, this moment of being downloaded with the pre-birth plan, it was like two tons of bondage had been released from my spirit. You know, like things had no longer happened to me they had happened for me because on some soul level, I had chosen it for the involvement of myself. And my human cannot understand how something like childhood sexual trauma could help my soul evolve. But I just have like this very strong faith today that my soul knows what's going on. And like, I don't have to connect the dots. Like I can just be here for the mission and show up the way that I'm supposed to. So they show me this whole plan and they're like, okay, so now you're ready for the second part of your mission. The first part of your life was boot camp. The second part will be going back for the mission. And I was like, I love all this information. I feel so like, I feel so much lighter and freer. I'm still not going back. I'm going to watch the show from up here. Like I'm going to grab my PJs and a bowl of popcorn. Like I am not returning. <laughs> And they were like, you have to go back. You know, this isn't a punishment. This is just about the, the, you know, the mission that you signed up for. 
And they told me that, th that this was the most exciting time to be on earth because we are in the midst of the great awakening and that there's so many souls that have signed up to be on earth at this time because we are in the midst of transformation. There will be a, yeah, a, a dimensional change in thought that will happen in our lifetime. And so like, I had to go back to be part of it. And I was like, ah, oh, there's thousands of other souls down there doing the work. Like, yeah, you guys don't need me. Like, I'm just one, you know? And they were like, it's happening. They said, listen, if you don't go back into her, we'll give you a new body to go back into, you know, but like, you have to go back. And uh, they showed me this little baby that I would be born into. And this baby was going to have to experience many of the life challenges that I had already experienced because she was going to take on my cart, my grocery cart. And, um, you know, like, I just thought, there's no way that I could start from zero. Like I've already come this far. Like if these are really my only options, I guess I'll just go back into her. And I did all of this very begrudgingly, <laughs> you know, like I really did not want to come back. And um, I just could not even imagine what overcoming could even be like, like there was, you know, I couldn't even imagine because my life was so weighed down in these dense experiences of poverty and addiction and prostitution and degradation and, um, so yeah, you know, like I found myself sifting back into my awareness and I remember them very clearly saying like, trust us, the second half of your life will not be nearly as challenging as the first. And I was like, I do not trust you. <laughs> yeah. And I came back into my body, you know, and that's, that's the, yeah, that's my spiritual experience. That's what happened there. That's amazing. That's just the, the imagery of the putting the things in your cart it's so that's so cool the way that you perceived that it really it makes so much sense um before we started to record I asked you was there something that was on your mind that you wanted to talk about and I really want to delve into that uh can you share what you told me yeah yeah so I think you know like a big part of my own journey has been manifesting a new life for myself and then the way for me to do that was that I had to do a lot of internal healing so there was a bunch of signs and synchronicities. They're very divine. And I mean, just like almost poetic that led me into the space of recovery. Because when I came back from my experience, I just thought like, oh my God, I was so high that I thought I was talking to God. <laughs> like how crazy. Right. You know? uh, and I just wrote the whole thing off, but the universe made it real known to me in a very loud, tangible way that it was not drug induced. Like this was a real experience and I had to get onto another path. And so I entered a long-term rehab uh, for drug and alcohol addiction. And I ended up, it was a nine to 12 month program. And I ended up staying there for uh, a year and a half, which is like an insanely long amount it of time. It's good for you. Yeah, it was, I mean, like I had nothing on the outs in the outside world. Like I had right. nothing, I had no relationships. I had no family relationships, no friendships. Like there was nothing for me. And, um, and I, I really needed time and space to heal because I didn't know how to do anything without being sedated first. Like I didn't know how to do anything at all. So I took this time and treatment as like a, a time to just re-educate myself. Uh, I had, didn't have to worry about food or clothing or rent or bills or anything, right? Everything was taken care of for me. And so I took this time away to study every sacred text to read everything I can get my hands on about metaphysics and the law of attraction. This was the first time in my life that I was using my mind. Like this vocabulary that I have, it did not exist four years ago. You know, like the extent of my vocabulary before my spiritual experience was just this long laundry list of drugs that I used and how much money it cost to be with me. And that was it. And so, you know, in this space, I just started to like really educate myself and learn as much as I could. And I, I learned about the law of attraction. And I realized that I've always been manifesting my experience. I was just doing it unconsciously. So my thoughts before were, I'm a drug addict, I'm a prostitute, I'm impoverished, I'm homeless, I hate my life. And so that was my experience. And so now I have different thoughts. My thoughts are, I'm an abundant individual. I am surrounded by spiritual community. I have a connection to my spirit guides and angels. I love my life. And so that is my new reflection of life. But it took a lot of internal healing to get there because like I couldn't just affirm out like, I love life because I yes. didn't. <laughs> you know, like there was nothing lovable about life. So I had to really go in and address those core wounds. And for me, some of my core wounds are, I got major abandonment wounds. I have huge rejection wounds. 
Um, my inner saboteur, she loves like taking the spotlight in my life when things start going good. And, um, and, you know, my addiction is like this huge gaping wound as well. Like my number one coping mechanism, my best friend, my partner through every aspect of my life. And I had to heal all of those things. So, you know, like I'm a big advocate for the law of attraction. I think that it's amazing. Like, you know, the podcast is magic is real. Like magic is real. We can like actually call things into our experience, but it takes healing work first. You know, like I can't just affirm a bunch of positive thoughts if I don't actually believe them. I got to get to the core of why that belief system is not in me. I love that. I'm a huge law of attraction, law of assumption person. And it always feels so validating to hear from people like you that have really experienced it um, fully and also who have been to quote unquote, the other side, which is really right here with us all the mm -hmm. time and can kind of confirm that that's true. Because sometimes I'm like, is this, am I just, it doesn't even matter to me because I think even just using that language, it's like smile and you'll feel a little happier, not under horrible circumstances, but if you're, you know, having a low day, you're, it actually tricks your brain into thinking you're happy. So I, I always thought of it as, well, I'll do these and I'll feel because it changes the way I feel. It changes my vibration. And therefore I'm more open to receiving abundance in all areas of life. So I love that concept. And I, yeah, what, um, I, I would love to know, because I'm sure people wonder too, as, as soon as you came out of that experience, how long did it take you to check yourself into rehab? What was the sort of the, what were the weeks after that like? Did it take, I mean, you said at first, you're like, no, I was just hallucinating. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it took a while. It took a couple of months for me to like actually realize that, that this was like a real thing. Yeah, some really beautiful synchronicities started. I mean, now I see them as beautiful. At the time, yeah. I was like, this is chaotic and insane. But like all of my drug dealers stopped selling drugs, like all of them. Like I had yeah. like a whole arsenal of drug dealers because I was a drug addict. And like I had been dealing with these guys for over 10 years. None of them knew each other, but they all decided at the exact same moment to stop selling. And so I, I now I had no way to get them. So like that was the first synchronicity you know, like to push me onto a different path. And then I found myself on a train. I had no destination. A man appeared across from me and he was wearing a 12 step fellowship necklace. And I heard a voice very distinctly. And it said, that's your path. Follow him to a meeting. And um, I went to a couple more meetings over the next couple of days. And I went to a women's meeting the next day. And this woman grabbed me when I walked in and I did not look the way that I look now then. Like then I was super skinny. My skin was gray. I was totally sunken in. I lost most of my teeth. Thank you, recovery, for letting me buy some teeth in my life today. Oh, you look uh, gorgeous. You know, I looked, I had like these huge holes in my face from picking my skin because I was convinced that bugs were living inside of me. Uh, you know, like I was really, really torn up. And this woman, she hugged me when I came into the room because like, obviously she could tell that I was messed up. And she whispered in my ear and she said, you are worthy of all the love in the universe. And it was the same message that I heard my father and my boyfriend tell me. Wow, I just got chills. Yeah, it was, and I just, I knew it, you know? And and yeah, and about a couple of days after that, I ended up going into, into treatment. Um, but it took me a minute because like, it's so far away from what we're taught about what the world is that I just, I could not believe that there was any sort of like universal love supporting me because I felt so unworthy of love. Yeah. And that's, I think, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I know that's a big core issue with addiction is not feeling worthy. I didn't feel, I thought I was wrong. It was always, I'm being rejected because there's something wrong with me rather than looking at, no, I'm choosing people that will reject me to reinforce my negative core belief that I am not worthy. And yes. you don't see it at the time. You're like, nope, but just keeps being reinforced. I'm unlovable. I'm not yeah. good enough. I'm, And so you just continue to perpetuate that cycle, even, even subconsciously. And I know that um, uh, it was like, why do I keep choosing this same kind of person? He didn't seem like that at first. Well, that's because on a soul level, or I used to call it, it's, I used to say it's sort of like gaydar, but it's uh, the like sex and love addict version of um, you just, even if they come off totally normal, 
there's this subconscious thing that's drawing you to the person that's wrong for you, or that's a narcissist, or that's a love addict themselves, or that's a sex addict themselves, um, or that had childhood trauma and can't bond. So it's really, I always found that really interesting that we even subconsciously perpetuate the cycles that we're used to. Oh, and, yeah, totally. Yeah. I think that, you know, and and that's, and that's the law of attraction and action, right? So yes. like, and it's also our soul lessons, like the belief that I have in the pre-birth plan. Like I have signed up for specific lessons. So like in my life, I was always dating the same guy, but he was like wearing a different jacket. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like always the same soul lesson, but with a different human, like a different avatar, but it was always the exact same thing. Yeah. And again, yeah, I felt like so victimized by the world. Like, why can't I find a good guy? You know, like, mm -hmm. but it was me, like these men are reflections of me and they're also showing up for our soul assignment together, which is to be lab partners for a specific lesson. So, you know, like most of the lessons are about self-love, forgiveness, and healing the inner wounds. So yeah, you know, like once I started to heal all of my codependency issues or like the fact that my worth was always tied up in whatever my partner wanted. So like, I never had any dreams or aspirations of my own. It was always like, you know, like I would be married and my husband wanted to be a musician. And like, my only goal in life was to be a musician's wife. <laughs> you know, like I was going to support him in his dream, no matter what it cost and have no dream of my own, except to be his support. And so like, as I started to heal all that codependency and all of those wounds around that, I attracted a wonderful partner into my life, you know, like that it is reflecting to me the healed aspects of myself. And still, you know, like we have our own soul lessons to learn together about like people pleasing, standing up for ourselves, but we do it in a healthy way. And we do it like based around recovery and spiritual principles and things like that. So, you know, like, because I healed myself, I no longer attract toxic people into my life because that's not the reflection of myself anymore. That's beautiful. Yeah. We all still have work to do myself included. Um, and, but it is so beautiful that now you have that self-awareness and, you know, people pleasing, that's been my whole, that was my fourth step. Every mm -hmm. single, every single resentment or this person hurt me when I came to what was your part in it? I was people pleasing. I didn't set boundaries. And that's, I didn't have the kind of trauma that you did as a child, but I had my own internal stuff and severe anxiety. And so that's a people pleasing is a really um strong indication of, of childhood trauma, where we're just trying to fix everything and make everything okay, because it's too painful. And also because we're so sensitive, what resonated with me was when you said, my human doesn't think I can handle those feelings. And because we feel things so intensely. In fact, I find most addicts that I've gotten close with who are reco in recovery, we're all highly sensitive people. That's why we became addicts. You know, we, we, we felt too much and it was too painful. There are a lot of people that um, as a medium, I'll read for other people. And uh, I constantly have people come through that are like, this person passed from an overdose. And I'm like, he was just so sweet, like the sweetest thing ever. Just this heart, this pure heart. So I think it it is such a common thing for us to just want to, um, yeah, not only numb out, but also just try to not have to feel conflict or negative emotions. So we just try to constantly be ingratiating and um it's 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 I think I'm grateful for that quality in myself because it helps me get along with anybody um I just have had to sort of pull it back right yeah I think that well for me and if anybody is unfamiliar with 12-step fellowship your fourth step is like it's a complete and fearless moral inventory of yourself so you really break down a lot of aspects of your past and you find your part in your resentments and your fear and your guilt and your shame, you know, all these different aspects of ourselves. And um, for me, it was like unrealistic expectations. <laughs> I had so many unrealistic expectations around other people because I, I thought that somebody was going to save me from myself. I thought that somebody was going to, you know, like rescue me from like the pain of, you know, like everything that it was to be me. And, um, and yeah, you know, like I'm really grateful for the awareness that, everybody's on their own path, doing their own thing. You know, like I, 
I find a lot of comfort in, in the belief. And I, I mean, I have a deep knowing about the pre-birth plan, but you know, like, even if it's not something that you, you know, even if it wasn't part of my spiritual experience, if I had just stumbled across this belief, I would adopt it as part of my belief system because I get to design my belief system, right? Like this is a very creative act being a human. And, um, and for me, it gives me a lot of freedom because I don't have to really mess around with other people's healing experiences, um, like get too involved with like, you know, uh, what I think a relationship should look like, or like a friendship should look like, you know, like I, I just, I show up for my assignments today. And some of them I don't show up for, by the way, like some of my soul lessons, I'm like, you know what, I'll catch you guys next time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm skipping class this time. Like I'm not doing it. And, um, and I, it happens to me all the time. Like I literally, I say like, I'm skipping class. Like it will not be with this person that I learned this lesson with. And, and it'll come back around like a couple months later and it will be way more challenging because I didn't go to class. I didn't study. I didn't, I didn't review the material. And so then I'm just there with like my pop quiz right in my face and I have no tools on how to deal with it. That's funny. I, I appreciate that very much because I know that I do that too. And, you know, there's no perfect recovery. There's, there's, as we say, progress, not perfection. And I love that you talked about what the fourth step is for those who may not know. For me, I keep saying, I wish every single human could do the fourth step at different points in their life, even. Yeah. And I think that, you know, there, there are actually Gabrielle Bernstein. She's like one of my favorite authors. I, I love her too. Her one day. Yes. Same. She's she on has my a, vision board too. Yes. Me yeah. too. Me too. Um, she has a great book. It's called judgment detox. And it essentially is a fourth step for the collective. Um, and I think that a lot of her books, you know, they really integrate recovery and A Course in Miracles, which is another reprogramming tool that I use as well. Um, but yeah, if you're interested in like doing a, a fourth step, Judgment Detox, like that's the book for you until I write my own book like that. <laughs> and you're going to, I already know that. And uh, it's, and I, it, even the minute I sat with you, I, I've seen interviews with you. And the first thing I said to you, like, not that looks are important, but I just said, Oh, my God, you're so beautiful. You look like Judy Garland before things went wrong. And, um, you know, uh, I love I just love her and think she's, she was absolutely gorgeous. And, um, but just to see you in that form, it's not that I'm trying to be shallow. It's just the fact that you can see your recovery, you can you're, you're glowy, you're beautiful, you're engaged, you're connected, and just like, you're so warm. And you've let that defense down. Um, and also, and I immediately, it's funny, lately, I've had people come to me instead of mediumship for psychic readings, which I was always more insecure about, because I'm like, I don't have a way to confirm. If I mm. say this is going to happen for you, I may not know that for 10 years. So with mediumship, I have a firm, immediate confirmation that what I'm seeing is right. And, um, but I've been surprising myself with, wow, i that person was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And so I looked at you, I was like, oh, she's going to be like a huge writer and, and like successful, like Gabby Bernstein, I'll read your books. Um, and I'd love to know too, I, I know you, I ask everyone this just to see what comes to your mind. You've already summed it up a lot. What do you want people to know? What's yeah, that's such a great thing? question. I, yeah. I love, I love that question. You know what? Like, I don't think that I, want people to really know anything. Again, I really believe in spiritual autonomy. I believe that everybody mapped out their life the way that it's supposed to be mapped out. So like when I first came back from my spiritual experience, I thought that I was the second coming of Christ. Okay. I was like, it's me, I'm Messiah, <laughs> you know? And I like went out on the New York city subway system. And I was like proselytizing and evangelizing and like yelling at people about like what I thought they should be doing. Mind you, I was like a homeless crackhead prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I, and it took me a long time to let go of that self-righteousness. So I know that you're not saying it like that. Like what if people- Yeah, but I love know? that answer. But that's a big part of my journey because like my spiritual ego blew up like when my actual human ego like might've died, like it was just replaced immediately with something different. And, you know, it's about, for me, it's about finding that balance in life. But I really think that something that's important to know is that transformation is possible. Not only is it possible, I believe that it's inevitable. You know, like as long for me, like 
I just keep doing the next right thing. I'm not doing anything fancy. You know what I mean? Like for me, I'm staying away from the things that I know destroy my spirit, which are drugs, alcohol, people, places, things, you know, like I got to stay away from certain things. And I do a little bit of, of work on myself every day. Like it's not, I'm not doing anything crazy. Like I'm devoting like, you know, two minutes to doing one question of like inner work a day. And um, your thoughts really do shape your reality. I mean, like, it doesn't seem like it. And as within, so, I got so many things I want people as to within, know. Never so mind. Without, no key, <laughs> right. I, I love As that. within, I so without. So yeah. like, for me, you know, like I have a coaching business. I get to work with people individually. It's such a blessing. Like, I can't even believe it. <laughs> like, you know, it's like so far away from who I was just, just a couple of years ago. And, um, and it, what happens in our physical body is really a result of what's going on internally. And it doesn't seem that way because everything in the world would tell you that that's backwards, that like the physical must be healed in order to get the mental straight. But it really is the emotional inner world, the spiritual world that is affecting what's happening in the human body. So like if you're experiencing like pain, uh, dis-ease, like any sort of, you know, dis-ease in your life. There's, there is a spiritual solution to it. And again, it sounds like totally backwards because like we're not taught that. Um, but if you do some inner work, just watch your world transform. It's wild. I mean, like I've seen people, yeah, just go from like the brink of like suicide to just like devoting a couple minutes a day to doing something different and just watching their whole world explode into something completely foreign to them. Me too. Um, I was, I just said that recently. I said if to somebody that I remember several of my now friends who are all super recovered when we all came in, we were like shells of ourselves. And I remember going in there, like, I just don't even want to be here. Not in the meeting. I didn't want to be here at all. I remember being like, I have to put my butt in this seat, but I feel like a shell. I don't even, I can't even breathe. I can barely cry. And I remember seeing one of my now friends who just was so angry and she was just constantly sobbing and angry. Now she is, um, she happened to turn to to Christianity. Don't have, you know, that's just her path, but uh, she's now married to a, a lovely guy. They have two kids. She's like speaks out about recovery. It's like, you would never recognize the people that we were and the way that we acted out and who we are now. It's I I tell people like you would not even know. And that's why I like to talk about it on this podcast, because if look, I mean, look at where we are now. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I hope that that gives other addicts hope. One of my very best friends was in prison for a couple of years. You would, this woman is successful and healthy and um, also a Christian and um, now works with other addicts uh, as a volunteer to Mm -hmm. kind of give them that kind of hope. And you just, she was living in her car. She was living in motels. Like, it's just, you know, you, you would never recognize that person in any of us. And yet that's part of who we are and we wouldn't be here. So in that, I say, I have gratitude for all of that pain as well. What about you? Oh my goodness. Yes. Thank you for sharing what you shared because the transformation, especially inside of a 12 step room is it's beyond like anything. And, you know, there's 12 step fellowships for everything. (laughs) So if like, you're feeling left out, like I don't have a 12 step fellowship to go to. Yes, you do. Trust me. There's (laughs) something for you. Okay. There's like technology addicts, anonymous. There's just like a caffeine, like there's everything, you know? Um, And yeah, and the 12 steps really are a beautiful tool. And, you know, I think really, uh, kind of what came up for me when you were talking is, is the idea of community that we get to like watch people on their journeys. You know, for me, there's definitely purpose behind my pain. There's so much purpose behind my pain. And I, I'm not going to speak that truth for everybody, but I really believe that if you're going through something very painful right now, it's because like your purpose lies somewhere within it. Uh, And you can't see it when you're bogged down in it, you know, like no one's expecting you to, but like, If you told me 15, like 15 years ago, me, that this is what I would be doing today, I would like laugh in your face. Like there is no way you could not have paid me a million dollars to ever think that my life would transform this way. Um, And if that's possible for me, it's literally possible for anybody. And I keep that in mind with every person that like I dislike (laughs) because, you know, I'm not like, I'm not super spiritual all the time. Like I still get resentments against people and people annoy me because 
fully reflect aspects of myself back at me that I'm I'm not I'm not ready to deal with. Um, but I think that you know even about like people that like in the collective like. I think about Donald Trump and I'm like, dude, if I can transform, Donald Trump can transform yep, too. Yep. Like, I know it. You know? I've, always, I've been knows. saying, I wish that uh, Putin could do the fourth step. Right, right, right. Maybe our world would be different. <laughs> um, and just as we wrap up, please share what kind of coaching you do and what the work you're involved with now is. Yeah. So yeah, a totally beautiful transformation. You know, like, yeah, four years ago, I was a prostitute. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, like through all of my, my dedication to recovery and transforming, like every aspect of myself, like now I have a private coaching business, I also work have a regular day job, like in the recovery field. Um, my job is a peer advocate which means that my whole job is just self-disclosure. I say, hey, I'm in recovery. If I can do it, you can do it. And they pay me a salary for that. It's like totally bizarre. I take people to meetings. I introduce them to recovery resources and community. And it's a really beautiful thing. And I swear, I think like the universe invented this job just for me <laughs> because yeah. it, like it just knew that like I wasn't, I wasn't skilled to do much else at the time, you know? And um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful for the fact that my life is, surrounded by people who are, you know, um, ready to step onto the path of transformation. I don't get it a lot in like my day job. Um, that's like, a, I'm planting seeds that I'm, I might yeah. never see come to fruition, you know, but when I, when I get to connect with people in my private coaching business, which is just about transforming any area of your life, utilizing the tools of law of attraction, shadow work. I, I do parts work with people, um, just to like really get down to those inner wounds, because that's really what it comes down to the wounding that we have as a society ancestrally, like in your DNA, um, through your own like childhood and into your adulthood, you know, there's a lot of energetic wounds that come onto our spirit. And so, yeah, it's just people with finding them, uncovering them, healing them, giving them the tools to do that. And, um, it's really just super amazing to be able to connect with people in that way and to watch them grow and flourish and step onto their path. You know, I always tell people like, if you don't believe in yourself, just believe that I believe in you because I really do. I believe that anybody can have the opportunity to live life of their dreams, despite whatever they, they perceive their limitations to be like, we are limitless. We are abundant. We are infinite. Yeah, as spirits, you know, and we can call on that energy at every, any given moment and bring it into our physical reality. That's so well said. See, and you thought that you coming back here wasn't going to make a difference. And, and, right. and look, <laughs> even if it's a ripple effect, like you said, yeah. you plant the seeds. There are unfortunately people who will never get there. But even if a few of them do, who wouldn't have otherwise, you've made a difference. And if one person gets sober because you inspired them, then they'll help somebody get sober because they were inspired by you. And I just, whoa, I have such big chills. Um, So I feel like we're very supported in this. I, I thank you so much, Betty. You're such a beautiful human and soul and sharing your story is going, I mean, just continue sharing that story. I know you are, and I know that you're still writing and it really, you're making you're having a ripple effect and I can't wait to see what happens next for you. Thank you so much for this space. And yeah, thank you for being so present and what, what a great conversation. I'm looking forward to carrying this energy with me through the rest of the week. So thank you. Me too. Thank you, Betty. Thank you so much for listening with an open heart and mind for your likes, subscribes, leaving comments below and sharing with like-minded friends. Your support means the world and I could not do this without you.